Hello, in this video I'm going to talk to you about an approach to thyroid cytopathology and uh, first we will look at a broad approach to the thyroid nodule and also understand some of the classification systems that are in use internationally and then in a separate video I will show some case examples. So in terms of the approach to the thyroid nodule, uh, it's always good to have a spectrum in mind in the beginning of uh, the possible differential diagnosis. So I've just done a very practical division into benign versus malignant. In the benign category, we would have the commonest cause of a thyroid nodule, which is of course um, part of a nodular goiter. So a colloid nodule or benign follicular nodule. And sometimes we can have um, uneven enlargement of the thyroid in cases of Hashimoto or de Quervain thyroiditis. Of course, neoplasms can also give rise to benign nodules such as follicular adenoma or herthal cell adenoma. Among the malignancies, we have the well-differentiated ones, which include papillary and follicular carcinoma, and the poorly differentiated or insular carcinoma, and a plastic carcinoma with a very poor prognosis, and medullary carcinoma, which does not arise from the follicular cells, but rather the calcitonin-producing parafollicular C cells. And then we have lymphomas and the possibility of metastases. So it's very important to understand up front that there are some entities that we cannot diagnose on cytology because of the requirement to examine uh, for capsular or vascular invasion. And these are highlighted here. So they will all be subsumed under the category of follicular neoplasm. And I just want to briefly mention another entity, the NIFT-P, which will also most of the time come under follicular neoplasm or other indeterminate categories on cytology. So the NIFT-P stands for non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. And here are all the diagnostic criteria. Um, I won't uh, elaborate individually on them, but I want to highlight that there is a follicular growth pattern and there is a nuclear score. Uh, this means that the nuclei do show features of PTC, perhaps not as well or fully developed, but certainly some of the way. And because of these two morphological features, it can be suspected or suggested as a differential on cytology. But because of the requirement of complete encapsulation or clear demarcation and the absence of capsular or vascular invasion, they do require uh, histology to be diagnosed. So hence, to reiterate on cytology, this is the terminology from the Bethesda system. Most of the time, NIFTPs will fall into three categories, follicular neoplasm, suspicious for malignancy, or atypia of undetermined significance. So now let's uh, have a look at the main elements of thyroid cytology. There are always two things that we really want to focus on, which is colloid and, of course, cells. Uh, a rule of thumb is that if you see abundant colloid, especially thin colloid, and not so many cells, you are more in the territory of a benign nodule. Whereas uh, on the opposite side, if you see less colloid and more cells, these are more often associated with tumours. Of course, these are not hard and fast rules. You can have very abundant cellularity in hyperplastic benign nodules as well. So when we first look uh, at low magnification, we want to focus on mainly three things, the cellularity, the architecture, which is extremely important and useful. If we see a predominance of microfollicles uh, such as this, they look like little rosettes with or without a little droplet of uh, colloid in the center. And one of the definitions of microfollicles used in the Bethesda system is uh, fewer than 15 follicular cells arranged in a circle or at least two thirds of a circle. The other important architectural uh, feature to look out for is the presence of flat honeycomb sheets where the nuclei are very well spaced and regularly spaced. And these are very classical in benign follicular nodules, including colloid nodules. If you have more syncytial sheets where the nuclei tend to overlap a little bit, there is more uneven spacing, there's some crowding, uh, you don't see clear-cut cytoplasmic uh, borders, or we see papillary structures, then of course we will think of papillary carcinoma. And if we see two cell populations with the uh, native follicular cells, which are quite small, and another population, of course we think of METs, 
So the third entity is the background, and for this, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's colloid in terms of the amount and also whether it's thin or thick. A very thick colloid can be seen in some tumours, particularly papillary thyroid carcinoma. And if we see anything that indicates we're looking at a cystic nodule, such as macrophages or just some granular proteinaceous material. And of course, don't forget to look for lymphocytes, especially if you have a oncocytic or herthal cell population, because there may be lymphocytic thyroiditis. On high magnification, we really want to focus on the cells themselves. Uh, in terms of cytoplasm, uh, we can have cells with fire flares, which usually indicate metabolically active cells. They can be seen in neoplasms as well as in non-neoplastic uh, nodules and uh, herthal cells. And of course, the nuclear features, specifically uh, for PTC, medullary, and also very pleomorphic bizarre nuclei in anaplastic carcinoma. Now let's take a look at the classification systems. So there's, of course, other classification systems, such as the Papanicolaou system, which I have not listed here. Uh, for example, we have the system that's used in the UK, which is the British Thyroid Association and Royal College of Physicians uh, system, where there are five categories, but you can see that uh, they are numbered, and Thy3 is actually broken up into two subcategories, plus... A follicular lesion of undetermined significance and thy 3 f which indicates follicular neoplasm. There is the Australasian system as well uh, which is a six category system and you can see that the, there are some differences in terminology. This is called indeterminate or follicular lesion of undetermined significance and then we have suggestive of follicular neoplasm rather than suspicious for follicular neoplasm. And then we have the Bethesda system, which is perhaps the most universally used uh, system, where again, it is a six category system. Uh, and uh, the threshold for excision is usually follicular neoplasm and above. So it's important to know this uh, and also communicate this with your clinicians. So for the 2017 uh, update of the Bethesda system, we have the six categories here and we have a risk of malignancy. And I just want to focus on uh, the indeterminate categories, AUS, atypia of undetermined significance, or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. Uh, the range of malignancy is about 10 to 30 percent. In the Western studies, it has been shown to be actually lower because uh, NIFT-P has been shifted into the non-malignant outcome category. In our hospital, it's about 27% as an overall. And in the follicular neoplasm category, it ranges from about 25 to 40%. And in our institution, it's about a third of cases within this range. So the management is generally quite conservative. For AUS plus, it is either to repeat FNA or to suggest molecular testing or even consider lobectomy if there are clinically uh, worrying features or there is a molecular signature that is worrying. Um, for follicular neoplasm, again, the standard is to, to offer surgery. However, molecular testing can also be done, um, in particular, a rule-out test, such as the Affirma test. So if the result is negative, uh, then there's a very high negative predictive value. So before I go on to just the summary and take home points, I want to just highlight one case. And this is a 54 year old lady with a left thyroid swelling. We can see that there is not much cellularity and uh, we really have to hunt for cells. However, there are too many to call this non-diagnostic. You know, there is a cutoff for uh, about six groups of 10 cells each of uh, roughly about 60 cells for adequacy, that is the threshold. Um, the cells do form uh, little, small, rounded and somewhat crowded clusters and we also have some microfollicular formations. But because there are so few cells and we are not sure whether some of these are, art are artifactual due to blood clotting, it's very difficult to categorically uh, say that this is a neoplasm. So this is an example of a case that will fall into the FLAS category. Uh, and it's sort of in the indeterminate atypical category in the Bethesda system with the management to repeat FNA or to offer molecular testing if available. 
Here is another example of a case, but this case is different because the atypical features lie more in the nuclei. Uh, there is a hint that the nuclei are somewhat pale, oval, there may be small nucleoli, but it's difficult to be sure because of the artifactual changes and entrapment in blood clots. So this would be an example uh, of uh, the atypical category with nuclear atypia. So AUS and FLUS, this is a category where the features that you see are not really sufficient to go into the suspicious category, and yet you can't confidently pass them off as benign. And there are some sub uh, sort of scenarios in which you may encounter, for example, if there is architectural atypia, um, sometimes there may be some crowding or some microfollicular formations, uh, then this can go into this category. And if there is cytologic atypia or nuclear atypia in the follicular cells, this also falls into this category. There is a definitely higher risk of malignancy if there is nuclear atypia as compared to architectural atypia alone. So it is very important to reflect this in the report. Of course, you can also have lymphoid atypia, in which case you may actually want to recommend uh, perhaps a repeat FNA with flow cytometry or a tissue biopsy. The outcome of this category really, again, uh, depends on the presence of cytologic or nuclear atypia. It can be actually quite high, the risk of malignancy in nuclear atypia. In our institution, it is about 37%. And for architectural atypia alone, it is actually significantly less. And this is uh, the ballpark figure given in the Bethesda system. In our institution, it's only about 15%. And with hurdle cell atypia, it is even lower. So the range in Bethesda system is about 10 to 30%. And uh, once you remove NIFT-P from the malignant outcome category, it becomes even lower. Of course, it is very important to do these studies in your own institution so that you have a good idea of the risk of malignancy. So the guidelines are to repeat the FNA, which can be definitive in a high proportion of the cases, or to offer molecular testing, for example, the Affirma rule-out test, um, where the results, about half, turn out to be negative, and this has a very uh, good negative predictive value, as you can see, a very low risk of malignancy, and hence, these are acceptable for observation. So one would have to really um, weigh the cost benefit of a repeat FNA versus molecular testing. So take-home points for AUS plus, uh, cytologic or nuclear atypia confers a higher risk of malignancy compared to architectural atypia alone. Clinical correlation is important, um, especially in the context of Hertel cell nodules. If there is a background of Hashimoto thyroiditis or multinodular goiter, the risk of malignancy or neoplasia is lower. And also, if you see isolated, very bizarrely atypical cells, perhaps with hyperchromatic nuclei, not the kind that we would suspect uh, PTC in, uh, we would consider also perhaps treatment effect. So the management uh, is repeat FNA or to offer molecular testing if this is available or accessible to the patient. So in summary, we've looked at uh, the Bethesda system categories. Again, remember that generally the threshold for excision is neoplasm and above. And for your cytology report, uh, these are the categories. So just in a nutshell, generally it's follow-up or repeat FNA, particularly for non-diagnostic cases. You can also do a cell block if uh, there is a liquid-based cytology being done. And for the atypical category to repeat FNA, to send for flow cytometry if it is a lymphoid atypia, um, and also to consider molecular testing. And again, uh, for the follicular neoplasms to excise, uh, also for suspicious and malignant nodules, and to consider molecular testing for follicular neoplasm. So take on points uh, in the general approach to thyroid nodules. The amount of colloid is very important, it's a key factor in the low power, so the more colloid, the more likely it is to be benign, because it just reflects the presence of large follicles. 
um, cellularity and architectural features are very important. And of course, you still always want to look in the background for things like lymphocytes, giant cells, inflammatory cells. For high magnification, uh, cytomorphologic features are very uh, useful, particularly in PTC, which is defined by nuclear features. And when to do a cell block, when you suspect medullary carcinoma, because this enables you to jump from a suspicious for malignancy diagnosis based on morphology alone to a definitive malignant diagnosis with ancillary testing. When you suspect METS or lymphoma as well, in which case you can also do flow cytometry. And I would say the four most useful morphologic features are flat honeycomb sheets, which will point to a benign nodule, micro follicles, which will point more to a follicular neoplasm if they are predominant, the presence of abundant colloid, which favors a colloid nodule, and of course, very specific nuclear features. So these must always be looked for actively in the alcohol fixed preparations. The specific morphologic features will be elaborated on uh, in the next video of various uh, common entities. Thank you.